Welcome back to Rackspace's live coverage from Austin, Texas at the Tech Gathering of the Year. You know, the place where Twitter found its wings. Foursquare checked in and Siri found her voice. It's Robert Scoble and friends live. The Rackspace Open Cloud Experience uh, here at South by Southwest 2013 in Austin, Texas. I've been uh, going around trying to get really cool uh, innovators and, and entrepreneurs in to uh, talk to, and I have a really special one right now, Stephen Wolfram, who uh, started Wolfram Alpha, and, among other things. <laughs> so he's really famous, and I'm really happy to have him here, really honored to have him here. So. I always ask, who are you? Like, you know, it's sort of awkward. Who this are you? <laughs> Stephen Wolfram. And what do I do? I, I don't know. I've done three things in my life, roughly. Built this thing called Mathematica, gets used by lots of people for R&D. Wolfram Alpha gets used by lots of people to kind of find out computational knowledge. And also, I've done a whole bunch of science, written this big book called The New Kind of Science that uh, has a whole, whole separate life of... Uh, that's actually been pretty interesting in the last uh, decade since it came out in, in letting all kinds of technology happen, including Wolfram Alpha, as it turns yeah. out. Well, thank you for what you've done. I, I used Mathematica back in uh, calculus class, and it uh, was r r really helpful there. And I know lots of lots of people use it for all sorts. Well, what do they use? Are they still using it? Sure. People are still I mean, using it. the majority of universities in the U.S. have site licenses for it. For example, people use it in lots of kinds of educational things. Yeah. It kind of started out as the name suggests, being kind of uh, about being used a lot in mathy kinds of things. It's kind of expanded a lot since then. It's sort of everything algorithmic is, is, its, uh, is its domain. And so now, you know, if you look in the, in the world at large, pretty much any sort of R&D group, advanced R&D group in any company, you'll find at least some mathematics in use in some industries. It's used a lot in production kinds of things as well. Um, I think right now, one of the things that uh, it's Mathematica will be 25 years old this year, wow. and uh, which it, it still it still feels ahead of its time in many ways, which is which is nice. Um, I think that uh, in fact, you know, one of the things that we are realizing is the name Mathematica is in many ways misleading. It's uh, because people say Mathematica must be about math. Yep. Well, actually, it's about sort of anything computational and algorithmic, yep. and uh, so you know, like it's got. A really good image processing system in it. It's got, uh, you know, sort of any algorithm that you know the name of. It probably has a good sort of automatic implementation of it. Like a bubble sort. Well, it just has sort. You don't need to know it's bubble sort. <laughs> I mean, the point is, what its good job is. You say, I want to sort this thing, and yeah. then its job is to figure out which of you know 30 algorithms is the best one to use for your particular case. And that's that's a really important idea in Mathematica. Is the idea of sort of automating things so that all you as the human do is to say, this is what I want to achieve, and then it's its job to figure out how to achieve that. That's sort of one of the, the principles that we followed in, in building Mathematica. I, mean, I think the, one of the things that, that's happened is the language that's inside Mathematica, they're calling it the Wolfram language, is kind of this very powerful thing that lets you implement sort of any kind of algorithmic operation. And one of the things that's about to happen over the course of the next few months is sort of the the, uh, the exposing of that language in a much more serious way, particularly we're, we're coming out with a thing we call the programming cloud, yep. which is uh, basically that language implemented in a completely cloud environment, something we, we learned how to do as a result of building Wolfram Alpha in the cloud. Wow. Um, but now the idea is, you know, you have something algorithmic to do. Um, you can just write a few lines of Wolfram, Al Wolfram language code um, put in on the web, and uh, then you sort of press a button, you'll get an instant API that allows you to then execute that code whenever you need it on your website or generate a report when you need it, those kinds of things. It's kind of the, it's the, the sort of the shortest path to getting something algorithmic implemented. Yeah. And we're, we're kind of excited about that. You can already sense, talking to you, that you, you don't build tools like Instagram or Facebook or Angry Birds. You build tools for high-end scientific or programming kinds of people, right? That, which is well, we're trying to build. Which sort is of why the, the normal person probably doesn't know who you are. The the geek in the room certainly knows who you are, right? Well, I think the the thing that's happened, um, yeah, right. I mean, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take these very advanced kinds of things on the inside. You know, we spent twenty five years, twenty seven years altogether, sort of building up this whole web of interconnected algorithms and so on, that uh, you know, on the inside are doing very advanced things. Our mission 
is to take those very advanced things and make it possible for the everyday programmer, or in the case of Wolfram Alpha, the everyday person, to really get access to all of that power. That's kind of that's kind of the thing that we try to do, and for us, it's it's been really important. You know, we've we've set ourselves. Uh, yeah, we're doing kind of the opposite end of the world from lots of these kinds of folk because we built this sort of huge mass of of algorithmic code, and you know, one of the things that's been important to us. I've spent a lot of personal effort, kind of trying to keep this whole language that we're building completely unified and coherent. Sort of the the idea of this Wolfram language is sort of a different idea from most computer languages basically any other computer language, because other computer languages, it's like you have a, a small set of operations, and the language is kind of handling the bureaucracy of dealing with you know, object-oriented programming or whatever else. What we're doing is trying to put as much actual algorithmic work, algorithmic knowledge into the language as possible, and let it be the case that you as the programmer are just sort of describing these things with small set of, you know, the, describing these primitives and then all the all this algorithmic work is already built into the language. Yeah. So in other languages it tends to be the case, you know, people have assembled libraries but they're kind of disorganized and, you know, there's one library here and one library there. You know, I've spent, for better or worse, a uh, quarter of a century or so trying to keep this, this thing that we're building coherent so that all the pieces really fit together. That's turned out to be a really good investment because it's meant that now that we, when we have to build a new piece of functionality, whether it's you know dealing with analyzing giant social graphs, or whether it's dealing with uh, some form of optimization or something, we can expect to rely on all these other pieces that we've already built because they're all kind of coherent and, and fit together. So that's that's kind of the, uh, uh, the this. I think it's a it's a it's a pretty interesting thing because sort of it's a new kind of language. It's one where there's all the algorithms are built in. Yeah. And more than that, with what we have from Wolfram Alpha, lots of knowledge is built in as well. Yeah. So in the language, you can expect to say, you know, I want to know, I don't know, what are the coordinates of, uh, you know, large cities in the U.S. or something. That's something that's built into the language to be able to ask that question. Yeah. Um, and, and that's uh, really what, what catches my eye about Wolfram Alpha, the search engine you built. Well, it's not really knowledge a search engine. engine. Knowledge it's engine. It's a that's knowledge we, engine because it's not it. Google. It's, it's not searching anything. It's every time you ask Wolfram Alpha something, it goes off and computes the answer for you. Yeah. So there's, and, and most of the time these So you can days, ask it something like, what's the average rainfall in, in, in these three in theory, cities? Yeah. And it'll compute it, right? Yeah, right, right. That's, that's the idea. It's crazy. So, Right. Well, but you know what, what's happened there? Yes, it was a it's, a. it's a project which sort of one might think was impossible, and for several decades I thought was impossible. Finally realized about ten years ago now that that actually it might now be possible. So started to build it, and you know it's turned out sort of the idea is ingest the systematic knowledge that exists in the world and make it computable. By which I mean, if there's a question that can in principle be answered on the basis of the knowledge that's known to our civilization, we should be able to automatically answer it. And how, so, many, how many databases have you ingested into Wolfram Alpha? Gosh, Probably it's tens of thousands. I mean, it's, it's yeah. uh, of, but you know what's interesting is, the, in terms of domains, it's, it's several thousand quite different domains. Yeah. Which, um, but what's, what's sort of interesting now is that the pure sort of numerical data content that we have is in the 10 terabyte-ish range which is kind of comparable to the text content of the web. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, this is stuff that is not, it's not something we forage from the web, it's something that, you know, we're going to primary sources and getting this big blob of, of data. Um, and I mean, that's, the 10 terabytes are just sort of static kinds of things, not feeds and so on. The, the, um, uh, and being able to, to go from that, then the challenge is not just to have the data, but to be able to compute what people want from the data. Like, yeah. you know, you could say, from the data, you might say, I don't know, something about, you know, wh what's the International Space Station? You know, how, how much does it weigh or something like that? But what you want to be able to do is to compute from the observation that, you know, came in from the feed from a day ago. You know, you solve the equations to work out where the International Space Station is right now. And based on your geolocation, you know, can you actually, you know, is it in the sky above you right now? Those kinds of things. Yeah. So, so you end up having to... All the time, you end up not just sort of collecting raw data, but if you want to actually do something useful, you're ending up computing an answer to your specific question. Actually, one of the things people really like, which I had not really realized how important it would be, is that people don't just want an answer. They actually want some kind of 
contextualized thing. They want sort of a whole report. And it's sort of interesting that, that they don't even want a textual report. They want a report that has, you know, the right graphics, the right tables, things like this. Yeah. It's kind of a, a uh, and so that's, that's sort well, of that's, the, that's what I love about Wolfram Alpha. It makes me look like a genius when I figure out how, <laughs> what to use it for. Right. What, right. what are some of the things that people can, normal people can use it for, you know? So people use it, I mean, if you, if you look, so there's several different places where people use it. There's on the web, in apps, through things like Siri and S Voice and so on. Um, and the, the usage patterns are somewhat different in different cases. Yeah. So, so I think in uh, you know, one, one group that is kind of very, very broadly using it as students. And so what, what ends up happening there, you know, we see every day you know, these waves of homework going around the world in the, you know, in the query stream, so to speak. Um, as, uh, and I think by now, you know, I've, I've discovered that if you ask a typical high school or college student, there is an extremely good chance that uh, they'll be users of Wolfram Alpha at this point. Yeah. And they use it to solve, you know, math, chemistry, physics, you know. Because uh, you can put an equation in there and it'll do things with it, Yes, right? that's right. It'll do what, what, you know, what, what math has figured out how to do with it, pretty much we can do. And um, it's, uh, and that, that's, you know, that's something where, you know, the world of what you teach in math is gradually changing as a result of the kinds of things that we're doing because it doesn't make a lot of sense to have, it's really inefficient to have the humans do this stuff. It's much better to have the machines do it yeah. and the humans get to do other kinds of things that might be more fun for the humans but, um, and might be more educational for them. But what would be some search, or not some searches, but some queries, yeah. queries or some instructions that you would... Uh, well, I don't know, let's, should we try some stuff? Yeah. And, uh, let's, um, all right, let's, 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 let's see if it's alive. That's a good, good start. Let's, let's see whether it... Um, not quite, it's a bit of a slow network. Okay, let's right. wait for the, okay, two plus two, that's really good, okay. So, you know, we could say, what is the integral of, I don't know, x squared sine cubed x or something. That's a really geeky thing, that's the kind of thing that you might have, um, uh, oh, it's usually much zippier than that. Yeah. But, you know, it, it'll... Um, well, we are in a slow network, so... And, the, and uh, there's uh, 200,000 geeks in town. Right, <laughs> right. So kind of the idea is, you know, there's the answer, and actually for the, for the student crowd, there's, uh, if you want to, you can, you can say, uh, you know, show me, how, um, show me how I do that as a human. It's kind, of a, it's, kind of, it's kind of weird because the way that Wolfram Alpha does some computation like this on the inside yeah. is something much more streamlined and efficient. This is kind of specially prepared for the humans to show them how they could do it, which has little to do with how it does it inside. Yeah. But let, let's, um, let's say something like, um, uh, let's say, um, let's just, uh, just say Austin. Let's see what it, what it figures out about Austin. Okay, so the first question is, what do you mean by Austin, right? So it yeah. knows from GIP information where we are, so it's a pretty good guess that it's Austin, Texas, as opposed to it seems like there are four other Austins in, in the US and it uh, guesses we mean Austin as a city rather than a given name, but let's yeah. take a look, uh, you know, the types Does of things. Does it use any location uh, from where you're uh, searching from? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To figure out, I mean, yeah, you're yeah. probably talking about Austin, Texas, because you're in Austin, Texas. Yeah, yeah, right. So, I mean, you know, we can, we can know all sorts of things about, uh, about Austin. Uh, let's see, what are some interesting things here? Okay, nearby cities, all right, that's, uh, that's fine. You know, it's kind of interesting how all the different kinds of data that we have. Oh, look at that. It was founded 173 years ago. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of, all kinds of uh, characters who were born here. Okay. Or well, we could go and um, we could say it's always, it's always good, you know, when you, when you build a big piece of software and you can just kind of look out of the window and see if it's, the, can look out of the window there, see what, uh, see what it looks like. Okay. It, it does seem to be sunny. Let's see what, um, what other kinds of things it can, can tell us here. So it's telling us, you know, the weather in Austin, that's a, that's a plot of the temperature as a function of time, um, and uh, it's a prediction for the next few days. We can maybe ask it um, past 10 years of, uh, of weather in Austin. Um, there it is, and you know, it's, look at that. It gets quite um, uh, high of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. It gets quite, quite hot here. Yep. Or we could go back here. How about Yeah, we... you don't want to come to Texas in July. <laughs> uh, right, we can, let's just say, just for fun, let's say Austin as a name. See whether it can figure out what we mean by that. Um, and okay, so there now it's saying instead of Austin, Texas, it's saying Austin as a given name in the U.S. That's kind of fun. It's so that shows the number of Austins born uh, as a function of year 
um, over time. So there was a big peak. I wonder what on earth that was. A, a big peak around um, 1990. And then you can you can compute given that was how many Austins were born each year. You can compute here what the estimated uh, current distribution of age is for somebody called Austin is. And it's a this is a great Wolf Alpha party trick. If you have the Wolf Alpha app and you run into somebody and they say their name is such and such, yep. you type it into the Wolf Alpha app, and then it'll tell you what's the uh, what's the most common age for a person with that name. And it's amazing how the probabilities work out how often that party trick ends up being the name of the person. No, it's, 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 it's yeah. amazing what's in here. This shows uh, a, another trend, which is uh, now that you have all these thousands of databases, how do you convert it from you know, the database language into something that a human can get a pattern out of? You know, how do yeah, you right, a, right. a beautiful chart or something interactive, something that right. we can understand? Right, so I mean, that's part of the, you know, it, I, I view there as being sort of four pieces to the problem of Wolfram Alpha, so to speak. One is get the data, you know, get the right primary sources of data, make the data computable, you know, clean it up in all kinds of ways. That's problem number one. Problem number two is compute interesting things from the data, which means getting all those algorithms and models and methods and so on that come from science and engineering, financial analysis, wherever else, implement all of those. You know, that's 10 million lines of Mathematica code right there to, to do all of that stuff. Then the third might be impossible kind of thing is uh, how do you actually have the questions be understood by the system? You know, humans are typing these questions in natural language and how do you do that language understanding? Um, we made some pretty neat sort of science type breakthroughs that have let us go a really long way in actually understanding, you know, about 90%, more than 90%, 90, 91.5% last I knew, um, of the queries that come in to the, uh, to the website, we can now completely nail what this means, yeah. right? So then, and then the fourth piece, fourth piece is, uh, what you're referring to, which is, you know, okay, so we can compute all this stuff, we understand the question, we can compute all this wonderful stuff, what should we choose to show the humans that they will understand? Yeah. And that's a whole separate set of algorithms and heuristics and so on, of how do you effectively rank the different kinds of information that you can display, um, how do you make, sort of, do the computational aesthetics of automatically figuring out, you know, how to present the outputs and so on. And that's that's uh, that's another big piece. Well, you started your career in the late eighty or in the eighties, right? Um, is it mind blowing what you have today to play with? I mean, yeah, if you go yeah, back, it's neat. I mean, it's it's look, I I've I been. Mean, did um, you ever imagine you would have this kind of computing power on, on your phone? You know, back in the eighties. Well, the computers have gotten a lot smaller. You know, I was. It's kind of the one thing that's kind of funny is I used to use you know the highest end computers. I had access to the highest end kinds of computers, yeah. and you know I used to sort of feel a little bit pleased with myself that I had access to all these fancy computers. And now you know the computers that I use are the exact same computers everybody else uses, which is kind of nice in a different way. But you know, really, the the types of things that um, and you know gradually what's happened is, for example, in what we've built in Mathematica, sort of the core ideas. The idea, big idea being symbolic programming, that core idea has kind of uh, s sort of prospered very well over the last 25 years. Yeah. But about every 10 years, as a result of more and more powerful computers, there's another kind of thing that you can do with that idea. Like, for example, uh, one of the things that had happened in the past was there came a moment about 10 years ago now where you could have serious symbolic programs running kind of in the, in the user interaction loop. Yeah. So that led to this thing called CDF, Computable Document Format, which is a way of, of uh, creating interactive documents using our Wolfram language. So like, for example, this year, one of the things that's happening is our whole Wolfram language system uh, will be able to be run in a tiny embedded processor. Yep. You know, it's, in, uh, in fact, uh, later this afternoon, there's a 17-year-old a kid who's built a supercomputer out of little tiny arm chips. Uh -huh. And it's just mind-blowing what he's done. 17 years old. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I wish I had this kind of cool. brain power. But yeah. <laughs> it's uh, no, I think, I mean, no, for example, you know, the Raspberry Pi is a, yeah. you know, there's now a Mathematica running on the Raspberry Pi. So that's some. Um, that's is a some, $90 board, right? Uh, 25 bucks. 25 bucks, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, you know, it's so crazy. that's. But what's interesting about that is that means that you can have all the power of Mathematica actually running inside a little tiny device that is a consumer device that doesn't cost very much. Yeah. And you know you can expect to do all that fancy image processing and all those kinds of things. So that's a you know that's one of the things that's happening. There are these thresholds of, you know, can you take 
you know, one of the bets that I made very early, I mean, I, you know, Mathematica first came out in 1988. I, my first big software system I built in 1980, um, you know, one of the things that I decided to do with Mathematica is no compromises to the current state of hardware and so on. Yeah. Just do it the way it should be done and eventually the hardware will catch up. And in fact, the hardware, you know, more than caught up, it, it really, you know, enabled lots of different levels of capability to, to, be, to be done. Yeah. Well, let's talk about what's, what I'm seeing. I'm writing a book called Age of Context, and I'm seeing the number of sensors going up. And I noticed you're wearing oh, yeah, a little I camera, and we're going to talk about this little camera that you're wearing. Oh, yeah. Right. And uh, uh, the number of wearable computers is going up. I've been wearing wearable, and soon we're going to have... I saw uh, David Karp, who runs Tumblr. He's wearing a Google Glass already, uh -huh. so that's starting to come. And big data is, is certainly increasing, right? And yeah, I'm just showing a little, little, little yeah. Oh, there you go, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, a little camera. We'll talk about that in a second. And um, uh, social data continues to double. Uh, there's almost a billion tweets a day right now, which is just mind-boggling. I mean, when Twitter was hot here in 2007, there was only a, a few hundred thousand tweets done in the first year. And now there's right. a billion tweets every uh, done every 36 hours. It's crazy. Uh, and the amount of location data is going up exponentially uh, due to Foursquare and Waze and Google Maps and Navtech and on and on and on, on, right. and, on. and so you, you mix those five things together and that, that must get people like you even more excited about the future, right? Yeah, right. No, I think, I think this year is sort of a, a big year for, you know, sensors for everything. And, you know, we've been very interested in that and we've got uh, all kinds of things that we're doing. About a year ago, we released the pro version of Wolfram Alpha which among other things allows you to upload data sets of all kinds to Wolfram Alpha to use its analytic capabilities to kind of try and tell you something interesting or tell you a particular thing you might want to know about your data set. Um, it also kind of one of the things that gets most exciting is mixing sort of public knowledge with your data set. So actually knowing, you know, you upload your data set, it's got names of cities in it, let's say, our linguistics can recognize that those are names of cities. Um, we can then go and compute things about those cities. If you have data about some particular thing, you know, city by city, it can know how to divide by population or some such other thing. So, you know, I think, in fact, for example, one of the things we did, uh, so I myself have been kind of an enthusiast of collecting data for a long time. And so I collected lots of data on myself. I started about 25 years ago collecting um, all sorts of little pieces of data, like you know, keystrokes I was typing and emails I was sending, and all sorts of other things. You've never thrown away your emails, right? No, no, no. I never. Uh, throw me, them away. I throw away the bad ones. <laughs> I keep the good ones. No, but... no, I keep all of them. That's why? Uh, um, because it's easy to do. Because it takes less less effort to decide what to keep if I just keep all of it. Yeah. And that's been my attitude towards you know pieces of paper I write on. You know, I just keep it all. I don't. You know, I never know what I'm going to need. Sometime in the future. So you're the the hoarder of the uh, tech industry. Yeah, I'm the information <laughs> packer. No, I mean, you know, what was surprising to me, you know, a year ago, I kind of did a bit of analysis of, of some of the stuff I collected and kind of wrote about it. And you know, I, I thought people would come out and say, you know, uh, you know, you think you've got a lot of data. I've got a hundred times as much data as you've got. Nobody showed up. No. So I'm, I'm, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm kind of, I think I'm probably the, the, uh, the dubious role of being the most data collected human so far. Well, um, the, the, I know of one guy at MIT that's trying to, to get <laughs> over your line. He's putting uh, sensors all over his house and he watched how his kid learned how to speak. Yes, yes, sensors, yes. No, that's right. right. No, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I just have motion sensors in my house. I don't have the video. I, I, my, 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 my wife and kids wouldn't go for that. <laughs> no. yeah, it's some... Um, um, so where do you think, does it, first of all, does it frustrate you that there's data sources that you can't ingest? Like, like the Twitter feed, uh, you, have, you would have to have a license for the Firehose Twitter feed, and you might not have that. Well, we, that yeah, we, we'll, we'll do a bunch of stuff with Twitter. Um, it's you know, not something we've built out yet. Um, but you know, I think that the, our general approach is, you know, first of all, we seem to have a pretty easy time you know, making arrangements to get various kinds of data. I think we're probably a non-threatening entity, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that the, the question is more our ability to 
sort of, you know, we're a fairly small operation. I mean, our whole company is only 700 people, so 700 yeah. people is, is, is modest by the standards of, uh, of, you know, we've got far more projects than, um, uh, than that number of people can, um, uh, can, can satisfy. And Although we have a new scheme, we're going to, we're going to start spinning off companies at a, at a more aggressive rate. So I think that will, that will help to get more of, the, more of the weird ideas I have actually, actually realized. But you know, in terms of this data stuff, one of the things we did last year is, is um, you know, people, I collected a lot of data on myself. Most people haven't been sort of uh, obsessively. Uh, not maybe data. obsessively, but people are collecting data about themselves now, even if they don't think that way, right? They're, if you tweet, that's data about yourself. Absolutely. And if Absolutely. you take an Instagram photo, that's data about yourself. And right. So, so on for example, and on and I, I'm wearing a watch that's watching my heart rate, and that's streaming up to the cloud now, right? Yep. And more and more data is going to be captured about us. Right. So, so I mean, there are a couple of things we're trying to do. So, one thing we're trying to do is provide a good generic analytics platform for device vendors and so on, and lots of device vendors we've been interacting with. I think it's going to end up being a pretty great thing because one's going to be able to have all this data come into our platform, then you're going to be able to, with Wolfram Alpha, you'll be able to you know, talk to your phone, whatever else, ask it, you know, interrogate the data that has been collected uh, from your various devices and have gone up to the cloud and have been analyzed with our analytics platform. That's one kind of thing. Another kind of thing is you know, we've uh, we built out some Facebook analytics um, where you can uh, just go to Wolfram Alpha, connect it to the Facebook API, and then find out all sorts of funky stuff about, um, about yourself and your friends and so on. And it's, it's pretty interesting, particularly in the way that that ma mixes kind of your personal data with sort of public data and being able to say, you know, we, we've just, you know, we've been bringing out a, a series of different enhancements to that. And you can kind of see your friend network and then we do all kinds of fancy graph theory behind the scenes to tell you, you know, which of your friends are the best ones at kind of connecting disparate groups of friends together and things like this. Yeah. Um, and actually, we just got some data um, just analyzed in the last few days uh, because we started to collect anonymized uh, uh, Facebook data from, from our users. We actually also have a data donor program, which has been remarkably successful, where people you know, check the box, actually donate data to our study of these kinds of things. We haven't yet analyzed that data. We've started off analyzing the anonymized data. But you can get all kinds of lovely stuff of you know what uh, like I just had a plot of um, uh, you know if you're a, actually I had a, I had a plot I just had it up here All right. see if I can pull it up yeah this is a typical kind of Mathematica thing this is um, this is a plot of if you're this is showing if you're 20 years old these are this is the distribution of ages you probably want to go a little bit to the left there we go if this is if you're 20 years old that's the distribution of ages of your friends and now let's just move this up a bit you know as you get older. You know, there's a broader distribution of ages of your friends. Okay, you've got a bunch of younger friends and not so many older ones. Okay, now we're starting to get some extra peaks from kids as yeah. the um, so on. So it's kind of fun to see all this stuff. And uh, actually, a lot, of, a lot of these, if you go down to the younger ages, you start seeing, you can see all kinds of fake ages, like the 23 and 33-year-olds, you have to believe. Those are one digit off from the 13-year-olds. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the nature of this kind of reported data. That, um, but you know, it's a, sort of a typical example of the kind of thing that you can, you can easily start to see in aggregate. But for you as an individual, you can see all kinds of things about your social network and uh, how different people are interacting. You know, we can now do some image processing on, on photographs, things like that, tell you interesting things. And actually, for example, with this little camera, Hopefully, by the time I give a talk tomorrow, I will have done some analysis of the, uh, of, uh, I've only been wearing this for, for a day or so, so hopefully, including this very discussion, right? Yep. It'll be somewhere in the, in the stream of, uh, of things, and, you know, using image processing, uh, you know, picking out the faces, and, um, uh, and so well, on. This morning, I interviewed uh, Kuzu, which is making, uh, taking your old cell phone and making it a webcam, so you put it in the window, and then it, it can watch your neighborhood. Um, which some people have good good uh, views of streets, you know. So, and then you, they can do image processing on that to see how many how many cars a day go down that street, right? It's, right, right. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff if you have good. Uh, good right. Well, so, so I mean, the, the thing that we're trying to do is provide sort of the analytics, the generic analytics back end for all of that kind of stuff, yeah. and you know that's what that's sort of the dividend that we get from having spent you know, quarter of a century building up this sort of huge network of algorithms and so on. So, you know, when it comes to figuring out what cars go down the street, 
you need an algorithm to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, we happen to, I know, you know, people have written car detection algorithms using the Wolfram language image computation stuff. It's rather easy to do. So, you know, there you have it. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to do with that platform. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, it's such a, it's so great to, t I could talk to you for hours and, at, and did at dinner the other night talking about sensors and wearable computers yes, yes, and right. what it means. Uh, are you going to get the Google Glass? I expect so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I get, I get pretty much every kind of weird gadget sensor type thing that comes out. It's, um, people, people seem to send me all kinds of funky stuff. It's yeah. kind, of, kind of fun. How, how would you use that? How would that change? Because we're heading into a new age where we're, gonna, we're wearing our computers. We're, we're not the, just sitting the computer on the desk anymore. We're going to have it in the bathroom, in the kitchen. In, right. In, so the work. big thing for me is sort of preemptive delivery of information. So right now, you know, you're using Wolfram Alpha. You're using it through Siri, for example. You know, you're pressing the button on your phone. You're asking it a question. You're specifically saying, I want to know this thing. What, what's coming in the future is just preemptive delivery of that information. When, when the heuristics in the system tell you you should care about this, then the information will get displayed. Now, the trick is to do that really well, to have the heuristics work really well. Otherwise, it's like, oh, gosh, there's always this weird thing that's being displayed here. I'm just going to ignore that. Um, that's the thing, you know, I used to be very scared of heuristics. I used to believe that, you know, any time there was something heuristic, it would be, uh, you know, it would just break. Um, but for, for a lay person who's maybe listening, what is a heuristic? So it's something, so an algorithm is something where you say, given this precise input, there's a very precise definition of what will come out. A heuristic is, let's do something that's more like what we feel people do, which is to say, well, given all my common sense, this is how I think, uh, you know, this is what I think the result should be. So, you know, it's a, it's a heuristic to say, we, you know, when we type in Austin to Wolfram Alpha when we're sitting right here, it's a heuristic to say we probably mean Austin, Texas. Yeah. But um, it would be, you know, the algorithm might just say there's, uh, you know, there's six Austins in the U.S. or something. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what, what uh, the, the challenge is to make, to really perfect, you know, and what turns out to be the case, as in a lot of these kinds of things, the more knowledge you have, the more you're able to get these heuristics right. Yeah. So, for example, you know, we could say, well, let's figure out which Austin we're talking about. Well, we have to know, you know, how big a town is Austin? Where is it? All these kinds of things. In fact, for example, in language understanding, one of the things that was really a breakthrough for us was realizing that, you know, people have been trying to do language understanding for 50 years and had had dubious success at doing that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that made it a lot easier for us is a lot of being able to do language understanding correctly is based on having actual knowledge about the things that the language is talking about. Um, and so it's the same kind of thing, I think, with heuristics about what to display, what to, you know, what preemptive knowledge to deliver to somebody. I'll give you an example of where it doesn't work. Uh, Saga, this new contextual app, uh, kept showing me information about a golf course. Well, I live, because I live on a golf course. And therefore, it assumed I was interested in golf courses. Right, so right. I don't care about the golf course. I don't play golf. I don't want to know about golf. And it keeps showing me information, and there's no way to turn it off. So it bothers me, right? Right. It's, it's noise in the system. See, see, I think really what's happening is there are really three different kinds of things. There's sort of public knowledge. There's kind of uh, there's sort of your, your private uh, collection of knowledge. And then there's this kind of stream of sensor data that's coming in. And the really, really interesting stuff comes from sort of linking all three of these things together. So that, for example, knowing that you don't care about golf, if, you know, if one was able to read your tweets and read your, you know, emails and, you know, and also know where, you, you know, where you've been walking around, then that's an easy heuristic, right? Yeah. That you're not going to care about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you have to have all of that kind of information. And sort of the backbone tends to be this public knowledge which is you know, what we've been spending a Wolfram Alpha, lot, lots, of, lots of effort to kind of make public knowledge computable, so to speak. Yeah. And, and now, now sort of, it's actually easier often to make some of this private knowledge computable because it's actually more structured. People, you know, it's, it's just, there's this thing, it's a location, it's a coordinate, something like that, um, rather than, you know, it's this yet another domain with different kind of characteristics. And we're really in the Apple One days of this new field. Right, of collecting data while you're walking around and doing something predictive with it. You know, we've seen maybe the first few products, Google Now is a good, good example of this, but they're right. really crude and they're 
they don't have a whole lot of value. Um, yeah, next uh, next uh, few years it's going to be pretty interesting in this area, I think. And I think I think it's going to you know for us, for example, the big thing for us is you know we spent a great many years building all of this content in our system, all these algorithms, all these kinds of things. One of the biggest challenges for us is we have far more than people know. Yeah. So. And you know, when people say, well, I'm going to go to Wolfram Alpha, and you say, what should I ask Wolfram Alpha? Well, you can ask it all kinds of things. But you know, what can I ask it is just a big answer to that question. Yeah. But if it's preemptive, if it's telling me things when it thinks I'll find them interesting, then that's sort of a way of exposing all of this work that we've done. So you know, that's exciting to me because you know, I like to see all the effort that we put in you know, be actually delivered to people. And this is, um, this is a way in which I think that's going to happen. I, I'm wondering. Um, I'm wondering how contextual the Google Glass operating system is going to be. It, I can see a world where it will know that I'm running or skiing or shopping or walking or r driving or skiing or riding a bike based on the sensor data, mm -hmm. I, and I know that's coming. I don't think it's coming this year, but it's coming in the next two years. And if the OS could supply that to you then you would have all sorts of information from what I'm putting in the system. You would, you would know, for instance, I have to go across the street to get my badge, right? And I have to do that before Tuesday morning <laughs> because I have a speech over there right, on Tuesday right, morning. Right. And so you could do preemptive stuff. You could yeah, right. look at the weather. Oh, it's pouring rain right now. Exactly. So I'll go right now. It'll be not pouring rain in two hours, so go then. <laughs> right. right. Is that so, the kinds of yeah, things exactly, you're thinking about? Exactly. I mean, so, so, you know, the question is then, What's the role of the, the human, so to speak, in all of this? Because you know, you're kind of being told what to do by the system all the time. Yeah. Well, I think that increasingly, and this is kind of the, the, the long-term historical lesson of automation and technology, is the human gets to say what should happen. The trick is to automate how it happens. So the human says, you know, yes, sure, I'm going to give a talk at South By or something. Then, then the rest of it is, you know, okay, then you need to be there by such and such a time. Here's the plane reservation. Here's the, you know, whatever. You know, all of that stuff, the trick is to get as much of that stuff automated as possible. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of the, the, uh, uh, the future is kind of the, the humans say what the, what the goal is. Then sort of there's automation within the system to achieve that goal in the best possible way. And, and often it will be very non-trivial to achieve the goal in the best possible way. You have to have all this external knowledge coming in. You have to be able to compute, you know, do all these algorithms for, you know, optimizing things. Um, and, you know, one of the things that will happen is, you know, there are particular domains of, that people work on where, where they have been so, sort of successfully um, made computational, but there's a, a vastly, you know, so there's, a, there's lots of expert knowledge that people typically don't use on a day-by-day -day basis. Yeah. And things would be a lot better if they were able to make use of that, but they're only going to do it if it becomes sort of trivial and automatic to get that done. And that's, that's kind of a thing which I think as we see, you know, the sensor data makes it possible then people like me have to actually do the real work of actually doing the computations, you know, taking that raw accelerometer data, figuring out what it means, um, you know, then figuring out how that's related to, you know, the, the elevation data for what, you know, the surface you're walking on or the, um, you know, having ingested the floor plans of some building or something to figure out what that means, all those kinds of things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the, uh, I'm pulling all that stuff together. And I think, you know, the thing that, that we've been trying to do is sort of to make the kind of um, knowledge-based computing platform that makes all that stuff possible. And uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting to see the hardware coming into place to, to really do exciting things with it. Well, this is why we're excited about o open sourcing the cloud, because uh, you just mentioned like 16 different kinds of databases that are going to need to be built in the future uh, and filled with lots of weird data. I mean, I, you know, Autodesk, we, we visited Autodesk recently, and they, they can tell every piece of data in a modern building that was just built. They know the elevator shaft, who built it. Absolutely. They know who, who maintains it. They know uh, when it needs to be, um, you know, uh, checked or the authorities need to come by and make sure it's working right and when it needs to be maintained, all sorts of data. And you can fly through the buildings now with visualization systems. Back, we're going to see one in a little while. That lets you do augmented reality kinds of cool stuff. Um, well, you know, let's you know, back, one, one let's back up. How, how is what's the infrastructure of your company? How has that changed over the thirty years of your career? And, and where do you think it's going next? 
Well, in terms of, I mean, so the, the delivery of Mathematica, for example. Was, know, it, was CD? Was it even oh, CD? Floppy disk, floppy disk, floppy right? Disk, yes. First, <laughs> first, the very first There's version. There's a lot of people at South by who have no idea what a floppy disk <laughs> Indeed, is, which yeah, is mind right. blowing to me. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the first programs I wrote when I was probably 12 or 13 years old, they were on paper tape. Yep. And then it was, uh, and then, then it was cards. Then I, you know, my first uh, big computer system was built on min so called mini computers, which were actually the size of a large desk. And you know that was uh, accessed in a you know there was you know you, that there wasn't even you know, there was no real graphics at that time yep. and uh, you know so that's a so then you know that changed by the late eighties and then you know Mathematica we were at first distributing on floppy disks and so on you know this this idea of using the the uh, the desktop you know the laptop whatever that's been something which has continued to survive and I think it will continue for a certain class of person. Um, there's, you know, the delivery of what we're doing on mobile and the cloud and so on. That's that's important. In fact, what's happening right now, if you look at our technology stack, um, you know, the thing that's really neat. Okay, so we are, you know, back in back in the old days when we were building Mathematica version one, it was, oh my gosh, this thing is, you know, needs many megabytes of memory. It'll never fit on any of these computers, right? Yeah. So you know, we only operated on the high-end Macintoshes and the yep. you know the, the other kinds of computers. Yeah, but only I, I remember getting my Mac to CXs, and I think it needed that kind of class of computer, which was a forty-five hundred dollar computer, right? Right, right. But I mean, so so you know, but we took the point of view from a software engineering point of view. We're going to build what we want to build. The computers will catch up to us. But we also then had this kind of discipline of we're not going to use much memory. It's going to be you know very efficient. Well, that turns out to be pretty important in today's world, where we're running on, you know, on iOS, on mobile devices, where we've got big cloud deployments, where it matters what the memory footprint is, and we've got, you know, lots of users using things and so on. So it turned out that sort of early software engineering discipline, actually, which seemed irrelevant for quite a few years, it seemed like everybody's got tons of memory, don't worry about it, yeah. um, has actually become relevant again. And, and even more so, you know, we, from the very beginning, we had divided our computational kernel from our user interface front end. We did that back in 1988, and you know, at various times in the intervening years, people said, "Oh, that's silly. You know, it's inter-process communication overhead, and so on. You should merge these things together," which we never did. We just made the inter-process communication more efficient. And now it's fantastic that we have these, you know, separate computational kernel from user interface because that's what we need for all these modern devices. So it's kind of funny how this history sort of, uh, you know, things reverse themselves and so on. But but today, you know, delivering things in the cloud and on mobile. You know, we've now got basically three different platforms that we'll be delivering our, our whole technology stack on. Um, and that's, uh, you know, the, it's, it's really interesting to me, the sort of reinterpretation of the core capabilities that we have for yeah. these different platforms. And whether it's, you know, at the user interface level on iOS, that's interesting, or in the cloud, trying to understand, you know, well, what can you now do? And, and the thing that's really great about the cloud is all the sort of immediate deployment options that people have. So, you know, previously you'd write a program, it'd be a Mathematica program on your desktop, and, uh, you know, then you maybe could make something where you could, you know, double click it and you'd get this thing on your desktop. Now, uh, with our programming cloud, for example, it's okay, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be some embedded web page? Do you want it to be some instant API? Yeah. Do you want it to be a report that's automatically generated somewhere inside your cloud infrastructure that just gets mailed to you every Monday morning? You know, all of these things are sort of trivially accessible from this one kind of uh, cloud well, portal. It's, it's amazing watching internally at Rackspace how the world has changed. You know, 10 years ago, if you wanted 100 Linux servers, it would take weeks. Right, you'd have to call salesperson and say, "I need 100 Linux servers, and how much money it costs." Many, and those machines were yours, whether you used them or not. Right. Right. And um, now I, Adobe is starting up 20,000 uh, cloud instances, VMs, in a minute, or in an hour. In a, it, it, no, in a minute. It, it, it's. In a, I'm sorry. In an hour, it takes six seconds to start up a new, a new server. And it's just mind blowing what you can do, what you, how that could cause you to think differently, right? Because you can do new things. The, right. The, you you can say, oh, I need a hundred servers now, and, right? And, and in six seconds, you have them. Right. Well, so for example, with Wolfram Alpha, we, you know, this is obviously a cloud service, and it, it used at the time when we built it, four years ago, 
it was not easy to virtualize what we were doing because we really needed to be very high efficiency. We're really actually, you know, we're not just serving web pages, we're actually computing. Every time somebody types something in, off it goes to a bunch of parallel pieces to compute all the different results and assembles them again and, and sends it back to you. But th that's a place where we were, you know, the fact that Wolfram Alpha is possible and became possible at this time in history, so to speak, is a consequence of the fact that sort of the, the world of the cloud has happened and computers are fast enough and we can get enough of them in parallel to do it. I think with, uh, with the things we're doing with this programming cloud and Mathematica online and so on, this whole idea of I'm doing a computation now, oh, by the way, I want 25,000 processors to work on this computation, that now becomes possible and within the Wolfram language, it's actually, we have all these parallelism primitives, so it's trivial to do that. It's just, uh, you know, it's one line of code. And that's, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to do that for some of my own, you know, I like doing basic science and so on, and so occasionally I need to, you know, I, I say, I don't want to wait for two days to get this result. You know, just send this off to, you know, 10,000 CPUs or something and get it done. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm real soon now that's going to become sort of a one-line thing for me to do, which is which is exciting. Wow, uh, the CTO at uh, Autodesk calls this an infinite computing, right? Because he he doesn't have to build another data center to do that job. He just says, just like you did. Yeah, right. Do it. <laughs> yes, yes, right. It gets, <laughs> right. gets done, right? Right. It's a crazy new world we're heading into, and we're going to need this new world with all of this data that our cameras and our eyes and our watches and our cars. Yeah, I was talking to Toyota and their a car it streams off gig, gigabytes of data because right. of all the sensors in the cars and they're adding more sensors to do self-driving cars, right? Right, I think, I think the That's challenge common. is, you know, all this data is coming in, you know, all these different kinds of data are coming in. Question is, what do we do with this? You know, we can make individual apps that are like, okay, I'll have an app that does this particular thing. I'll have an app that you know, looks at, you know, my heart rate data or something like this. But more interesting is to relate my heart rate data to my data about, you know, what was I, you know, what was I doing during the day? What phone calls was I on? What, uh, you know, what made which phone calls made my heart rate go up? Whatever, whatever else it is. Get right? rid of those friends from Facebook. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, you know, I, I block them from Facebook. Exactly. Yeah, right. No, I, I think, I think, you know, but but this, you know, so what, what, uh, you know, I think the challenge now is we've got these computing capabilities, we've got the sensor capabilities. Now the question is, what do we do with all this stuff? How do we find what we want from it? How do we do analysis? You know, some of the stuff we're interested in, you know, with Wolfram Alpha and that whole technology stack, we're making it possible for people to do linguistic queries to you know, extract what they want to know. The other thing that's interesting is, given all this data, can you detect what's interesting about it? Yeah. Can you automatically figure out you know, what you should care about in all of this data? And that's the thing that, um, well, with, with some that's of what hard. we're doing. Actually, it's not so hard. It's is not it? so hard because, see, again, knowing- Like, like I, might, I, did, I didn't bring my computer, but on, on just my computer, I have a new tweet every half a second. I'm figuring out the one that I should pay attention to Okay. I think that because that's the one that you want to put on my Google Glass. I don't exactly. want to see a stream of tweets right. coming on my glass while so, I'm talking to you. So right? this is where one needs algorithms and heuristics and so on, and that's where knowing all the tweets you paid attention to before, knowing you know what's in your email, knowing what websites you visited, things like this. Then we start to be able to build up some kind of actual model. You know, we do topic modeling. We say, you know, uh, he's interested in stuff about nifty new devices. Yeah. He's not interested in, you know, random pitches about I don't know cats. what something. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, it, Ma Mashable has the angry cat, <laughs> and, okay. it, and they have lines around the block to take pictures of the angry cat. Oh, I don't okay. care. <laughs> I don't Fair care. Enough. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So so fine. So get rid of cats. Get rid of cats. Get rid of golf. That's uh, that's. Um, but uh, you know. So so that you know that that's the kind of thing. But but I think it's important that you know you have to have personal analytics knowledge about yourself. And you also have to have sort of public knowledge about, well, okay, that, that name, you know, the Siamese, well, that's, perhaps that's a type of cat. You know, you have to know that. That's a piece of real world knowledge. It's not something that you're going to be able to deduce just by doing, you know, data, you know, just by, just by looking at the raw stream of text and so on. But um, I could talk to you for a couple hours, but I know you have to go. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us here no, at, at Rackspace. And, uh, I love, what you love your work, so thank you, and uh, thanks for what you've done for humanity, because it's uh, quite quite good. So. Thanks a lot. And by the way, we, we can find it at Wolfram Alpha, right? And uh, 
where else can where, where else should we follow you on the internet? Uh, Wolfram.com. Wolfram.com. Thank you so much. So this is the kind of thing we're doing all day long. We're going to have another uh, interview up here in a minute. Um, we're going to stop for a second to switch microphones and stuff like that, and uh, keep keep coming back to see more from South by Southwest at the Rackspace Open Cloud Experience here in Austin, Texas. Thank when Rackspace's live you. coverage from Austin continues, we'll show you the future in real time. Rackspace, backed by fanatical support, bringing you live coverage from South by Southwest daily. Hmm, so good, it hurts.